Welcome to Famous Graves Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Knox. This is episode 17. And my uh, charity that I'm going to stick with because I'm going to create a nonprofit uh, is for epilepsy. And I want to start off every podcast talking about epilepsy for a brief period of time because I think it's very important. And my main focus that I want to um, focus on uh, is... That the fact that uh, social media, television, and film, um, here we are talking about inclusion and diversity and all these other things, but that doesn't seem to pertain to epilepsy or seizures because they're still making fun of seizures in movies, TV, and social media like YouTube, Instagram, TikTok are still allowing um, people to make fake seizure videos and mock people that are having seizures and imitate seizures. There's a, co- a comedian, I won't call him a comedian, but his name is Stephen Ho. He's got millions of followers. He's got two fake seizure videos where he's imitating seizures. Um, you know, to me, acting like he's a doctor, not giving medical advice at all. To me, there's a whole um, array of things that he's doing that are uh, illegal and definitely the uh, medical board of California should be notified. And I kind of run into uh, this argument about free speech. And I'm all about free speech. What I'm not about is somebody watches that video. You have millions of children that have their phones and they watch that and they see this guy with 11 million followers. And there's other people like him. I'm just singling him out right now uh, because he refuses to take his videos down. Uh, I've requested, asked him multiple times. Many people have asked him multiple times, and he refu- he, th- he thinks it's funny. And that's the problem. When you have – it's the old adage of, uh, you know, if, uh, if the one person calls you uh, stupid, ignore them. But if the two people do, buy a saddle. Uh, and so many people have told him, could you please take these videos down very nicely? I'll take mine down if somebody asks me. And I've had that happen. I've had family members that have asked me to take that down. And uh, – for uh, graves that I filmed, and I said, sure, no problem. And I know that I might be repeating myself here, but there's 65 million people with epilepsy. California has uh, the most adults and the most children. And you have 400,000 adults in California, 60,000 children in the school systems, no laws whatsoever to protect them. Uh, again, that means that the schools don't have to carry their medication. They, they're, they're required to carry EpiPens, but they're not required to carry any sort of rescue medication for epilepsy. Epilepsy's, you know, the epilepsy's in the Bible many times. Put it to you that way, how old it is. And still here we are making fun of people who have uh, this disease that kills people, kills more people than breast, breast cancer. So that is my goal, just to bring awareness and education. Um, my bigger goal would be that the Epilepsy Foundation in Los Angeles actually has a inflatable giant brain, kind of interactive, that the kids can go into. I don't know why they, but for 13 years they've refused. I've asked dozen times to come to my child's school and they refuse to do that so i would like to obtain uh, purchase one of those inflatable brains uh, they're about fifteen thousand dollars and uh I'll, I'll volunteer i'll go around to all the schools because nobody seems to want to get off their ass to do anything and that's the part that bothers me and then you've got places like uh oberlin college that uh uh you know had a defamation uh, against a bakery and uh, they had to pay the bakery $36 million because they lied saying, and, and all that happened was the, the, from what I'm reading, the, the bakery chased out people that were trying to rob them. And then the school stepped in and made this big thing about how the school, how the bakery was horrible and boycott this bakery. And I just find it interesting that these schools have now turned into these big political, uh, I don't know, these, these kind of, crazy places where they're just uh, shouting people down and cancel culture from the school. The school is the one that's supposed to be the school is supposed to be the person that's that's, uh, y- you know, has uh, that looks at both sides. And I just remember being in college, uh, y- you know, and there weren't across the board this many things. It was kind of very centralized of what people were protesting about. Uh, and they would sit th- and they would sit and listen. They would have marches and rallies and everything, but they would listen to both sides. Now it's just shouting each other down. They don't care. They want to, you know, put the other person down. They don't even want to look and see if maybe they, if the facts are all there or not. Uh, and it's very just p- people's opinionated of screaming at each other. The uh, this week uh, there were fifteen uh, tiny homes that burned down at the uh, veterans uh, uh, campus in West Hollywood. So if you've never been there before. 
This is another thing that the uh, I see on the news. I see on the news they'll take photos of the of the old buildings that are now condemned or abandoned because that veterans has been there. I mean, way back when, you know, and there's also a cemetery, a great cemetery, uh, a national cemetery. And uh, what they've, any veteran can go there for housing, any sort of, anything that they need is right there. And there's a hospital there and everything. And I just hear all these horrible things about there. But if you were to go there, you would see, oh, there's nice buildings. There's a nice hospital. If you go in the hospital, it's a great hospital. You get great care. They have a another facility where you can have surgery and stay there. It's kind of like a hotel. It's just for veterans. So that's so much money going there and just constantly they're complaining about how they don't have any funding or anything. So they had this parking lot area where they would allow the veterans who basically didn't want to live in the program and get drug tested uh, to, you know, they could live in tents. And then somebody came along and donated these little tiny homes. There's another place in North Hollywood, which was tiny homes. There was a place that was tiny homes. Uh, Ted Hayes was an activist in LA who had these little dome homes for like 25 years. Worked great. So I'm all about tiny homes. I think it's a, it's it, it could be better, but it's a great starting point. So they had these uh, tiny homes put in there a couple months ago, and now you've had this huge fire. And the problem with that is that you're giving these free homes to people that are drug addicts. They're mentally ill. They're they're not whatever you want to say is they're not the best making the best choices. And so. It's kind of like, I'm sure that when the fire was all put out, it was like, well, what did you expect? Um, because you're you're not, you're really just kind of sugarcoating everything. You're not dealing with the the huge problem, which is you have these homeless people that you need to speed up the housing and get them individually housed, not in this little village there. Like it's a uh, uh, FEMA, you know, FEMA encampment. Uh, they could definitely do better. I do appreciate the start with the tiny homes. Um, but, you know, there's no bathroom in the tiny home. It's just a little, sh- basically, they're just little sheds with an air conditioning unit. You know, it's like bachelor pad place. Um, but uh, LA's just got so much, again, so much homeless encampments, graffiti. Uh, something's got to be done. You got elections coming up. I don't think anything's going to get done. Uh, you had people today that were protesting in Sacramento. Uh, I don't know why you're protesting against people getting housed, uh, giving people services, but we've got plenty of money. We're giving the Ukraine billions of dollars anyways, so why not give it to our homeless, uh, you know? And uh, I've been seeing a lot, too. There's uh, In California, we've got this thing where our governor likes to taunt the governor in Florida for some reason, and then the governor in Florida likes to say, well, at least our electricity is on, and then you know we all like to think of, hey, he's right, because uh, we have all these – we've been having, you know – energy electric problems for 22 years and the threat of rolling blackouts and the threat of uh you know not having any water which i don't quite understand because you've got uh we're next to an ocean and then you're telling us that the polar ice caps are going to melt and then all of california is going to be underwater so why not take that water and use that water for farming and for us to drink uh instead of just telling us that we we can't have any water and if you are in uh Again, it gets very isolating because if you were to drive up north, there's all these signs how they're cutting off their water. Well, you would never know when you live in Southern California. You just hear that we're in this drought. Um, But there's all this other stuff that's going on that makes it very political with the water. But again, we live next to the ocean. There's 12 desalinization plants in California. For some reason, they don't want to use them. Again, that could be solved very easily. Uh, Which brings me to the Tesla, which uh, is a very beautiful car. I'm not able to afford one at eighty thousand dollars, but I've been seeing a lot of Teslas driving around Los Angeles now with gas generators on the back, or pulled over on the side of the road with the gas generator. Um, I don't get it. I I I don't. Uh, I'm just. I guess I'm glad that I just didn't get one. I was not aware that you can only go a certain amount of miles with that Tesla. Again, very beautiful car. Uh, I just don't get it if you're going to go electric, uh, but you're carting around a gen- generator. I don't like paying the money for uh, the gas right now either. You know, when I worked in a gas station, it was 87 cents a gallon. And the only reason I remember that is because it was 1987. And my it was a father and son boss. It was on Arroyo in uh, Pasadena. And the, like, the grandfather owned the place, but he was too much of an alcoholic. So the son ran it. And the, the guy would show up once in a while. And like, they'd get in fights and scream at each other. And then the boss would take it out on me and... Until the point I was just, you know, I'm making minimum wage, which I made minimum wage for a very long time, but you're sitting in a box all day long 
and you're the cashier and you're bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars every day from gas and uh, and then you're getting screamed at. It was just a very toxic environment now that I look back on it, but I was only 17 and uh, I just finally just quit. That was one of the few jobs. Usually I'd like to, I used to like to keep a job for about a year uh, and I was very against quitting, but um, I just felt like, you know, you're why well, I could go, I could be treated like garbage somewhere else for a lot more money. So that's why I quit that gasoline station job, but I've never forgotten. It was 1987, and the gas was 87 cents a gallon. Also this week, the Boy Scouts had to pay out uh, $2 billion for all the kids that they molested, kind of like the priests, Catholic priests. And um, they, they basically just, the Boy Scouts shuffled all these guys around. And I don't want to say that I told you so, but I told you so. And I just remember my mom really wanted me to join the Boy Scouts. I think maybe it was the Cub Scouts. I don't know what age it is, but uh, she filled out the application for me in fourth grade, and I got to school. And then there were all the other there was like four boys that were dressed in their uniforms, and I just thought, yeah, I, uh, this is pre-internet, by the way. So you're judged a lot pre-internet. And I was just thinking, like, I can't come to school dressed in, as a Cub Scout because my friends are going to make fun of me. Uh, they're going to give me so much shit, and so. Uh, I threw the uh, application into the trash and and I just went home and told my mom that they canceled the program and knowing that my mom would never check up on it anyways um, which was you know kind of the good thing about my mom was she didn't really care all that much um, especially about the Cub Scouts so I dodged that one uh, she did of course force me to put up a Michael Jackson poster in uh, my bedroom which was the one where Michael Jackson's got like a yellow sweater on and then all my friends of course would come over and they'd be like what the hell is that man why you got that Michael Jackson and I'd be like I don't know and uh, that was my mom in a nutshell but uh, back to the Boy Scouts so uh, they uh, the other thing with the Boy Scouts too is uh, you know, and church groups do this all the time. They're like, hey, we're going to go on this retreat, wink, wink, and uh, we've got some men here that are going to be volunteers, uh, but, you know, they're great guys, and you don't ever meet them, and a lot of these parents just want to dump their kids off anyways, and then it's like in the middle of nowhere, so the kids can't escape anywhere, and here come these guys who they're like, yeah, these are great people. This is Scout, Scout Master Billy, and they don't mention that Scout Master, you know, Scout, Scout Master Billy just got out of prison, um, and, uh, so th- it's just, a, a, to me, it was always a recipe for disaster. Like, why would I want to, uh, be at this sleepaway camp there with people that I don't know that my parents have never met? There's no way to kind of get hold of you. I, I know a lot of these camps don't allow them to have their phones either. So I just remember in, uh, I went to camp twice and it wasn't Boy Scout camp, but it was, there were two camps there in, uh, Catalina Island, which I don't know why they don't. Uh, give Catalina Island like some sort of gambling because I think it would really take off. A lot of people forget LA County's got an actual island. Uh, it's got like 3,000 residents. Uh, but, you know, there's a really cool miniature golf course there, but, you know, and there's bars, and I guess there's no, you can't really have a car. I think it's all golf carts. There's not really a lot to do there. It's kind of, I guess, if you're drinking and being on the beach, but they really could play that stuff. I, it could be like Monaco, put it to you that way. Uh, it could be like a tax haven. I don't know why they don't do something more with uh, that island. But so I went to these two camps. One was like a, one was Camp Fox, and the other one was Toyon Bay. And the Toyon Bay one was like a, you're supposed to be like, you're, we're teaching your kids marine biology. And so, like, it was cool. You got wetsuits, and you went to, got to go, uh, like, uh, skin diving. And, uh, you know, they make you go through, like, some sort of lifeguard thing or something like that and then you you know you catch the fish or whatever we got like they caught octopus and they had us eat octopus and uh squid and stuff like that so there was a little bit of education going on there um but i had uh an asthma attack there and my parents didn't pack a uh inhaler so i had to be like practically dying in the nurse's ward uh and they like special ordered my uh inhaler and i I feel like i told the story before but um you know my parents had a boat and they never came they could have easily come over and brought it but no they had to wait all day for that inhaler and then the other one was camp fox where it was like uh there was no it was just a camp so it was and then it was like kind of military style where they made us like stand out and salute uh in like the sun and uh i remember Remember just figuring out, you know, if you do PK duty, if you put the dinner together, you don't have to stand out in the hot sun. Um, and, uh, cause they may just stand out there for like an hour 
like I don't know saluting the flag or something and then you got to go in for dinner and I just felt like if I could make the dinner help make the dinner and then clean up afterwards I wouldn't have to do all that other stuff and that's where kind of my thought process started of you, you can always sidestep the rules and what's actually going on you can kind of bypass everything and I was bypassing a lot of stuff at that camp um because the other thing you could do, I mean, you could clean up if you brought a bunch of candy and snacks with you. And that was the other thing is this, like the kid in my cabin got like a whole box full of candy and everybody opened it before the guy got back from like swimming or something and we all ate it. And then I wrote my mom a letter saying, you know, hey, could you send snacks? And she sent one stick of beef jerky. And I can't really say I was surprised by that. Um, I just wish that I had gotten a... Uh, uh, care package, but uh, you could you could totally go to town, bring you know all these snacks with you, and sell them when you're there at the camp because you're isolated out there at the camp. And there's only one store, and I think that store was only open for like an hour or two at lunchtime, and it was like a like a little shack that was on the beach or whatever. But uh, you know they had archery and sailing, and there were like some boats that sunk and they're still in the harbor. So I mean, for the most part, the camps were okay. But I uh, I just would I, I don't know I'd never go back. Um, but uh, Catalina Island, I always had a good time there. Uh, we would go take the boat there, sailboat, sail there, and then um, go uh, snorkeling, which was always fun. Uh, snorkeling in Emerald Bay especially was always fun. But so the Boy Scouts have to pay $2 billion. And the fact that the Boy Scouts have $2 billion, that should also tell you something, that they're in a racket too, kind of like the Girl Scouts, because I'm sure the Girl Scouts have like $4 billion. If you want to check out a reading, it's... Uh, September 16th for uh, a, a, uh, a talk about Craig Smith by uh, Mike Stacks wrote a book and it's in Los Feliz and uh, uh, Craig Smith I talked about him before but just a very interesting guy where he was on the cusp of stardom and was selling music in the 60s uh, you know counterculture kind of thing uh, and ultimately you know went uh, overseas and uh, you know got schizophrenia and kind of dealt with all mental illnesses and passed away in a park in North Hollywood. So very sad ending for somebody that had so much potential. And that's why that story is always something that I remember. Um, but uh, it would definitely be, I think I'm going to go there. That's uh, It'll be, yeah, it's next Friday. And uh, Disney is coming out with a new cartoon. Uh, I can't, I don't know if this is real or not, but it's going to be called Little Demon. And it's about a girl. I believe she's the spawn of Satan or she's like Satan's daughter. And all these people are, like, rallying on, you know, Facebook to have Disney taken off. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there that wants, well, you know, you've got all this horror stuff. You've got horror nights everywhere. I'm sure there's parents that would love this as a character. So my call is just to wait this one out. Uh, and uh, I think if Disney's got the balls enough to do it, um, I, I'm going to watch it and see what it is that they're doing. Because... Again, a uh, spawn of Satan, which is something that we'd always joke about in college. Uh, I mean, it just sound, it sounds just uh, absolutely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so, talking, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Yvonne DiCarlo, who is an actress. Uh, she has an unmarked grave. But if you don't know who uh, that is, that would be... Um, Mrs. Munster from the Munsters, Lily Munster, I do believe. And uh, she was born Margaret Middleton, changed her name to Yvonne DiCarlo. She was born in 1922, and uh, she was a Canadian, see, I never even knew she was from Canada, dancer, singer, actor. She was a very, I mean, you, I know you're seeing her on the Munsters with all the makeup on, but she was a... Uh, uh, she was she was a hot tomato back in the day there. Uh, I think she was a, she might, might have been a pinup, um, but she was a, a Hollywood star in the 40s and 50s and made several recordings and later acted on TV and stage. Born in British Columbia, she was enrolled by her mother in a local dance school when she was three. By the 1940s, her mother moved her and her mother moved to Los Angeles, where uh, she participated in beauty contests and worked as a dancer at nightclubs. I mean, could you imagine? Being in a nightclub, because nightclubs are different today than they were then. But, uh, you know, seeing uh, her in a nightclub as a dancer, uh, where do they even have that now? 
I don't, I don't, I think that doesn't even exist. She began working in motion pictures in 1941 in short subjects. She sang uh, in a uh, three minute uh, Soundies musical and in 1942 signed a three year contract with Paramount Pictures where she was given unaccredited bit roles. Uh, her first lead was an independent producer, E.B. Deer, in uh, the movie uh, Deer Slayer, 1943. So that's pretty good. She comes out here in the 40s. Um, she'd be under the age of 20. And uh, starts getting film roles. So she's had some talent. She obtained her breakthrough role in uh, Solemn Where She Danced, 1945, Universal Pictures. The uh, first American film uh, star to visit Israel. She uh, received further recognition as an actress for her leading performances in British comedies. Hotel Sierra, The Captain's Paradise, and Happily Ever After. She uh, starred in a CBS sitcom of course the monsters from 64 to 66 so what's interesting about that is the monsters was only on for two years but it was in uh i mean they were doing reruns i wouldn't be surprised if they're still on right now but it was that was a staple of like channel five uh it was on all the time after school and uh i'm surprised that i don't that i didn't know that it was only on two years i've seen every single one of them uh So she played Lily Munster, uh, Herman Munster's glamorous wife. She's a vampire, a role she reprised in uh, the film Munsters Go Home in 1966. I don't think I've seen that one. And the television film The Munster's Revenge, 1981. In 71, she played uh, a popular song, I'm Still Here, in a Broadway production. Um, And she had a best-selling autobiography, which was published in 1987. Uh, She was a stroke survivor. And uh, she died of a heart attack or heart failure in 2007. That's interesting. She had a stroke. I wonder if she was a smoker. Uh, She was awarded two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for her contributions to motion pictures and televisions. She uh, passed away in... uh, When did she pass away? 2007. House on five and a half acres in... uh, of Hilly Woodlands in Coldwater Canyon, which is a beautiful street in Studio City. That's pretty awesome. Five acres in uh, Cold Coldwater Canyon. I would definitely live on that street. Um, it's above Beverly Hills. She uh, described it as a dream home and hired an architect to help her design it um, with stained glass and panelings. She also built stables for her horses and a large swimming pool. She sold the property in 1975. In 1981, she moved to a ranch in San Ynez, California, near Solvang. In her autobiography, she uh, considered director Billy Wilder the big first love of her life. They met in 1943 when she was under contract at Paramount. Although she described him as a uh, lifelong dream man, she fell in love with him and admired his endless charm and wit. He was separated from his wife and lived in a rented home while they were together. Their short-lived relationship ended when he left her for actress Doris Dowling. In 1945, after the release of her second film, she returned to Vancouver and attended a celebration held in her honor at her former workplace, uh, the Palomino Nightclub, where she was introduced to billionaire Howard Hughes. She later discovered he had flown directly from Los Angeles because he wanted to meet her outside Hollywood. I would too, Howard. Hughes told her he had seen her in a movie, and uh, she initially felt just kind of sorry for the lanky, unfed (laughs) billionaire uh, I don't think she knew the half of it. The following day, they went out on a date and began a romant- romantic relationship. Hughes preferred to keep the romantic, the romance private, never mentioning it to the, the press, yeah, along with all the others. DiCarlo wanted to marry him, but he was not serious about the relationship, and she later wrote, Howard Hughes was one of the most important loves of my life. Aww. After the breakup with Hughes, she dated Robert Stack, Burt Lancaster. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and announced her engagement in 1947 to uh, her husband, Howard Duff. And uh, But they eventually separated due to his alcoholism. Yeah, there wasn't a lot to do back then except to drink. She uh, met Prince, uh, the Prince of Iran, where he visited in Beverly Hills in 1947. A week later, they traveled to New York and spent some time together. After the completion of her, fi- her next film, uh, she reunited with the prince. They vacationed in Switzerland and Italy, and several months later also visited the Royal Palace in Tehran. Stuntman Robert Morgan. And uh, they uh, <clears throat> he was in a movie, um, How the West Was Won, 1962. Towards the end of the film, there was a gunfight on a moving train between the marshal and a gang of train robbers. Doubling for the actor who played the marshal, Morgan was told to hold on to a log and sway between two flat cars, one of them carrying several tons of timber. I'm sure back in the day there was no uh, 
there's no insurance for uh, you doing these stunts, which is it seems absolutely insane that you're in between two flatbed cars. The uh, chains holding the logs together snapped, and Morgan was crushed by the falling logs. He was so badly hurt it took him five years to recover to the point where he was he was uh, able to just move by himself and walk unaided. Because his contract with MGM assumed no responsibility for the accident, DiCarlo and Morgan filed a million-dollar lawsuit against the studio claiming her husband was permanently de- disabled, which just certainly sounds like it was if he's crushed by a log. After the accident, DiCarlo worked uh, to support her family and was often away from home, touring with stage productions or performing in nightclubs. Morgan's constant arguing strained their marriage, and DiCarlo even considered divorcing her husband by 1968. When she returned home after a New Zealand tour, she filed for divorce on the grounds of irreconcilable differences. There's also a movie with Drew Barrymore called Irreconcilable Differences. They divorced in 1973. DiCarlo, um, in her autobiography, wrote about her faith in God. God has saved me and mine from some pretty sticky situations. For me, religion is a little like being... A Republican or a Democrat, it's not the party that counts, it's the man. Therefore, I care not what house of worship I enter, be it Catholic, Presbyterian, or Baptist. I elect God a long time I, <clears throat> I elected God a long time ago, and I'll stick with him because I don't think his term will be up. The Carlo suffered a minor stroke in 1998. She later became a resident of the motion picture television uh, house and hospital in Woodland Hills. That's where I want to go. Uh, that, I think that is a great uh, uh, program where uh, it's basically a retirement home for anybody that was in the film industry, and it's in Woodland Hills, and I definitely do support the motion picture and television. Uh, I think they changed the name of it now, by now, though. Um, she spent her last years there, and she passed away from heart failure January eighth, two 2007, and she was cremated. Like, subscribe, tell me who else you want me to see, and I appreciate everybody listening to Famous Graves. <laughs>